Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Aleš Novák. I'm team lead of third of three L3 teams, SUS has. And I'm going to present what L3 means. And uh, furthermore, I want to ask you for feedback on L3 because we are not getting enough of it. So the basic <coughs> agenda for today is I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna describe where L3 is placed, uh, what we do, uh, what the PTF is, because PTF is the crucial term. Uh, I'm gonna de describe the specifics of kernel PTFs, and then there will be a, a room for question and answers, qu questions, answers, and I'm gonna ask you for your feedback. So, where we are. Basically, there is the R&D developers, developers of the individual product teams, communicating with upstream or constituting upstream, etc. Then there are SUSE customers and partners oh, wishing to use our products, but of course encountering bugs and paying us for uh, for customer support, which is provided by uh, uh, customer support. Uh, which, well, there are, uh, there are certain levels. Uh, there is also there is also premium support, where some customers wish to be served by um, dedicated persons. Uh, the the Support is divided into three levels, L0, L1, L2. And in the dark history, I've been told that uh, customer support was directly communicating with R&D because they knew the people within R&D, they knew where to come uh, to solve the issue. But of course, this setup didn't scale as the SUSE grew. So this ceased to work and the L3 was um, introduced. So we act as a shield of the whole R&D uh, towards the customer slash customer support. And also we are in contact with partners uh, through the, their individual technical account managers. Well, to be completely fair, this arrow is not 100% correct because sometimes some partners communicate directly with the people within R&D, but this is a topic that we only recently uh, we only where is Scott? Uh, decided to uh, to change. So, what are L3 responsibilities? This is the brief list of what we do. As I said, we are an interface to R&D. Uh, we, our, our main task is, the res, is resolving uh, the issues, either doing it ourselves or coordinate the efforts of the rest of the R&D. Uh, we build the fixed packages. This is the task that is really dedicated to us. Uh, we track what fix which customer got for which product, for which package. And uh, beside that, we have several other tasks, like we are running our own virtualization platform because we uh, really need to have exactly the same OS images that the customers use. Um, we have, or we run the R&D 24 times seven service, even though it's mostly served by, by labs now. Uh, besides that, there's RH expanded support we are responsible for, and it should be said that we are supporting most of the SUSE provided products, uh, which, if you don't know, looks somehow like this, and this is a long list of products. Um, but because, because you are, of course, focused mostly on SLE, uh, Let's see what versions are supported. First, there are the regularly supported code streams. Oh, that's 
all the three of them. Emma, is that right? All 4.12 kernel, that's nice. Then certain customers pay us for the extended support, which still is getting maintenance updates, only they are not as frequent as in, in the general support products. Oh, we have 3.0 kernel, it's quite old, but some customers are oh, willing uh, to use something even more outdated, and there comes the reactive support. It needs to be said that the reactive support uh, is not something we generally uh, offer. Uh, this needs to be really settled individually. And we go as far as in the history as to 2.6.16 kernel. Um, so our work sometimes, for example, paleontology, historical, uh, yep, it's, um, it's really time machine sometimes. So the unsorted facts about L3. We are 30 people, more or less, distributed all around the globe. We are split into three L3, team, three L3 teams. Um, yeah, we are basically covering the whole globe. Uh, some people are focused on individual products because, as I've shown, the variety of the products is so wide that one cannot reasonably expect someone to be able to look at the same time into kernel internals and into cloud enterprise search. Yes, there are exceptions. Uh, so some people are uh, dedicated to, 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 to certain products. Some are rather generalists who prefer to look uh, into Python on Monday, assembly on Tuesday. Etc. Uh, we are a part of R&D. Mm, for a year now, we've been part of the Labs Group. Uh, we are not in direct contact with the customers. Uh, we are communicating with, with customers only through customer support, even though, okay, there are exceptions when we are needed on the call, but, but the same applies to you, I, I guess. And as I said, we are supporting all the products. Uh, continued. One important rule, okay, it doesn't fit here very well, but uh, is that the only, only latest version of a given package is supported, but this rule can't be always maintained. It's, it's clear that um, if customer is using two month old kernel and encounters a fix, and we don't have any suspicion that this fix might be uh, fixed by well, uh, it's the encounter issue, which we have no no clue whether it could be fixed by something that was later on provided with our maintenance update. There is no, it would be unfair to force them to update. Um, Bugzilla is the tool we use for communicating with both customer support and the developers. Uh, we are using some uh, tooling developed in the team. Um, most importantly, there is a solid ground tool which is managing the workflow uh, and tracking on top of the Bugzilla, which is a safeguard that no issue gets uh, forgotten. And we have PTF utils, which is a set of tools, mostly, mostly doing this tracking I mentioned, the tracking of what fix what customer got. And also it serves as an interface to the whole IBS. So it's more easy to use. Uh, okay. uh, and in the interesting fact, or it's interesting to me at least, uh, is that we have only one big queue of incoming incidents. It's completely unsorted. There are cloud and kernel issues on the same pile. And still this queue gets emptied eventually. Uh, and everyone is free to pick whatever he wishes. I think that's a nice thing about L3. Uh, this is the rough uh, graph of, uh, of the amount of incoming incidents. I don't know what's 
what might be interesting for you, but I think that it's clear that the rate of incident is growing steadily. Uh, this is the green line, and the blue one describes our efforts to leverage the amount of incidents by workforce. And if you notice the pike uh, in the beginning of this year, this is our attempt to bring in uh, the cloud engineers because we've observed a right, uh, very big rise in the cloud issues. So we brought in the people from cloud customer support. Uh, so we gave them uh, access to our tooling, but they are not part of the team. Uh, okay, facts about L3. What does it mean for you if you happen to be a SINE or need info of an L3 bug here? I've tried to compile things I've deemed are uh, important. Uh, if there is an L3 issue, there, there is a customer behind it, and perhaps he's impatiently waiting to have it resolved. And yeah, and this the customer behind the issue has, you know the consequences I'm not going to describe. Uh, one thing should be said, it, it, some people uh, feel a uh, large pressure um, when they are in the L3 bug. No one can reasonably expect anyone to solve it within a few days. But what is important, any update is welcome. Don't wait until you have completely perfect analysis of what happened. We, uh, any update is welcome because there is not only L3 in the bug, but there is only there is also customer support, and uh, setting a level of expectations is uh, really important for all the involved parties. Uh, if if you were chosen mistakenly, let us know ASAP. That's it. It has no sense to uh, for us to wait on developers while they are not the right ones. Uh, and one important part is that in Bugzilla, generally, there is only customer support, L3, and developers. Um, but if it's a partner issue, it's likely that it was even created by a partner. So there are people um, external to the company. Uh, so we have to behave like that. Not, I have to say that it's very, very rare that uh, some people don't realize that. Okay, uh, now how the L3 process works. I think that this is actually very natural, but let's go through it. First, the incident, the L3 incident, which means there's already a Bugzilla uh, issue created, uh, is in, in the queue I just mentioned. Uh, it gets picked by, by the L3, we call ourselves agents. It's being analyzed. If more input is required from the customer, it's being obtained through the customer support. It's provided. Then we might realize it's, it's actually not, not um, valid L3. For example, uh, it's unsupported products, uh, unsupported product or unsupported package, you name it, or hardware, or, so we close it as invalid. Uh, if we need involvement from the developers, being it labs or the product teams, uh, the maintainer of the package is involved, and that's one of the uh, one of the knowledge we share, uh, who's the right person for a given package or a subsystem. Uh, maintainer still may ask for more input from the customer, of course. Uh, eventually, the patch is found, being it backported from upstream, self-developed, you, know, you name it. Then it's L3 task to build a package. Uh, I've shown the error, uh, the arrow from uh, the L3 as well because the very, it's very common that the patch gets, um, is backported by L3 ourselves. Uh, then the package is provided to the customer, and now is the 
part where we are waiting for the customer to, write, to provide feedback, which can take uh, a long sometimes. Uh, the feedback may be negative. The, the, the patch didn't work, didn't solve the issue, so we are back to black. Or uh, the feedback is positive, and then we need to get the patch, or we need to, that's not L3 task, uh, but the patch needs to get to the maintenance, which means that in some future version, the, the customer will have the issue solved even without the PTF. Um, so the L3 is kept open until the patch is submitted somewhere, at least. That there is a, that's the task of maintainer mostly. With kernel, we can, uh, we can do it ourselves using for next workflow. And only after the, the patch is in, the L3 issue ticket can be closed. So, I've spoken about PTFs. Now, the, what do I mean? Uh, PTFs are per customer packages, with a slight exception of mass PTFs, which we are trying to uh, obsolete by EMUs. You, you happen to see one just yesterday. Uh, because the, the quality assurance for packages are, in most cases, not possible for various reasons, we need to strive to get the fix really minimal. And that's a very important part, uh, that the PTF can't be just based on add, to say it raw, raw. Uh, so it must be based either on the latest maintenance update, which was quality assured, or on, a, uh, or on the previous PTF, PTF um, if the customer has one. I mean, on the PTF uh, based on the latest maintenance update, transitively. Uh, PTF is supported uh, until it's obsoleted by maintenance update, including the patch for issue, uh, which has various, various consequences. Uh, it should not, not contain test slash debug fixes, patches, uh, if we need to provide such a debugging, we use test packages, test uppercase uh, for it. Uh, and what we put into PTF is something that we would dare to include into maintenance update. Um, so we can't just uh, put there a fix that we uh, would not like to, to have in maintenance. And there is one demand which comes rather from us or you then from the customers, uh, we, we need to uh, prevent having their patches which are not upstream if it's not justified. That's because we don't want to diverge from, from the upstream because it makes the, the support uh, or the maintenance later on harder. Okay, I've said that PTFs are Customer specific, what does it mean? Let's see a lifetime or a life workflow of a random package, which is, in, which is just uh, being released as a maintenance update in version 1.1. Then customer A encounters an issue, gets a PTF with patch for it. The PTF is based on the latest maintenance update, even though the package might be somewhere else already. Uh, then customer B encounters yet another issue and gets PTF based on the latest maintenance update. Then customer A observes another issue, third one already, and he gets a PTF which is based on the previous PTF delivered to him which means that if he installs the, this th PTF, it won't reintroduce the, the first issue he encountered. Then there is maintenance submission, and the package maintainer who is well aware of all these issues, because he had to approve them for a PTF, puts 
all the three fixes into this maintenance submission, but then it's a buggy package. The second customer encounters yet another fork or issue. He gets a PTF uh, based on the previous PTF they've been provided with. But when the, the maintenance update gets um, released eventually, it has all the three or four uh, fixes, but the uh, but the latest one, which was found only after a submission, is not there yet. So it gets to get into some future maintenance update version. Then uh, the package lives happily ever after until the active LTSS ends, which means the reactive support of the package starts should that be our in any customers. And then the code stream of such a package gets split into several per customer branches because reactive support means that there won't be any future maintenance updates. And basically, in this uh, part of the lifetime, it's all on us. Basically, we are doing the maintenance by providing PTFs based on previous PTFs uh, individually for each customer. Okay, facts about PTFs continued. PTF is not a magic gadget. It's just a set of RPMs built in internal build, build service. We have some special magic settings and build service for PTFs. Uh, PTF can, as any project, contain multiple packages. Mm. PTFs are being delivered through just a Apache download, but we are currently working on on uh, <laughs> on uh, delivering them through repositories because we just happen to be in 21st century. Uh, to mention, as I said, that PTFs are fully supported, fully supported, but there is one exception called one of PTF where uh, we can't commit to put a fix into maintenance, but the customer still needs to have it, and they understand that this package ca can be, or this PTF can be, uh, can be maintained only reactively, which means they have to ask for, for a rebase version, uh, but I think that it's clear to you what what does it mean in terms of maintainability and the cost on both the customer and our side. So we have we have to uh, prevent this uh, from happening by any means, by all means. And one important thing, which was uh, which was visible on the on one of the diagrams, is that until the customer provides positive feedback, there is no real expectancy on having the patch in, in maintenance. Uh, and from some customers, it's hard to obtain the feedback because once the issue is solved for them, they just disappear. Okay, now let's focus on kernel PTFs because I guess that's what's the most in interesting for you. Um, nowadays, Kernel PTFs are only built from, from a kernel source Git. Uh, in our history, we've been providing them by manually fiddling with, with the kernel source package, adding the patch into random random place in series conf. Wasn't that fine. Uh, so now all the PTFs are built from a given branch in in kernel source tree, which has various nice consequences like if we need to merge two PTFs for a given customer, we just do it in Git and it works. Uh, and it brings a lot clearer communication between you, us, yeah, you and us, and you and you, and, <laughs> and more. Um, and very nice fact about this workflow is that once uh, the P 
PDF is published and it's verified, which means that there is a check whether a published PDF is really built from the sources of, uh, of the branch it claims. Uh, it's tagged in the kernel source tree and uh, in, in the expanded tree later on as well, which is very nice because when the customer reports a crash of such a kernel and you see there is a PTF in a kernel version, you just easily can search it in the, in the list of tags of a kernel source tree. So you know exactly what the customer had and, on, and furthermore, yeah, uh, what they can expect, uh, which fixes they can expect the, to have in a further PTFs. Uh, let's describe the Git workflow. First, L3 has to determine on what uh, should a PTF be based, because we have this database I mentioned of, of what packages which customers get fixed. Um, so we search what PTFs for a given package, given product customer has, and eventually say that the latest version they have is PTF 123, or they don't have anything and the work should be based on the RPM tag, which means latest maintenance update. Then either the maintainer or L3 agent, whoever, well, whoever is preparing the source, uh, creates his topic branch for a given issue, basing it on what was decided in the previous step. Then the usual workflow, patches edit, it's put into series conf, pushed into kernel source tree, so there is a branch. Then we could check, we should check, or whether there was not a PTF released and approved in the meantime before the first and this step. If there was, the merging should be easy, easy task. Uh, then the, the project, the PTF project in build service is created. We have some tooling for it. Uh, then the contents of this project are flushed, flushed from, uh, from the current source branch. Then the package is built as usual, and when it's built, it's published on the PTF suze.com server, and eventually the tech is created by some automatic magic. And since then, ever since then, there is a tech saying this PTF refers to this commit. Okay, so that was about the kernel workflow. Now to conclude, so to conclude the whole presentation basically. Um, L3 is the way how issues reported by customers reach us, you. Fixes in PDFs have to be maintainable and kernel PDFs should be built from Git. And I suggest this is the preferred way how to communicate between each other, I mean the Git. Uh, I'm, it's, uh, it's not against attaching patches to Bugzilla, but uh, it can be supplementary. Okay, any questions so far? Um, can you go back to slide 15? I don't know, because this <laughs> freaking animations uh, <laughs> might be hard to 15. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, one of the issues we have, and I don't know if we have a solution for it yet, is where you show customer B got, um, now go back to where you were, that was fine, yeah. Um, 
and they received the 1.1.126 PTF. And their fix is not going to go to the mainstream, our mainline kernel, until version 1.3. How do we prevent them from installing 1.2 and reverting their fixes? I think often we've had this, and then we usually have to request a new PTF. Yep, build. that's that's a very good Based. question and an issue we are going to address one day. Uh, one thing is to make this window uh, the smallest possible, because this is a race window, uh, which if um, which in the history was wide or sometimes is still wide um, several weeks which means that many of such um, things can happen. If it would be white only two days, the situation will be much better. Uh, but except for it, we can also, there are several things we can do on our side, like once the maintenance update uh, is being published, we should be alerted and we can we, we should know which, uh, which PTFs fell into that window. So that's something that we want to address, but are, are not, not doing it at this time. So as you said, the safest way is if the customer asks for. I, I think what could also be useful is if we can find a way to inform everyone at this blue line phase, once we've crossed that, that we're releasing a PTF and we know there's a new release in QA, so we can predict that this PTF is going to, either we need to inform the customer, please don't you know do any more updates until we tell you, or we know at that point as we're releasing that PTF, we're going to have to probably build another one. It would be useful information or if we, would if we be can <coughs> detect that and know that at that point. Or if you would be alerted, we can proactively rebuild the packages ahead mm -hmm. at this or at any of this, the, the, this well, stages. It, okay. it seems to me that the only way, Scott, is to tell that customer B to lock their package, right? I mean, otherwise, when they run super up, they're going to get B12, and they're going to be right. They get that. They get that second buck right back. So they can only they can only lock the package, or we have to change our process to get that second patch onto B12 and send that out as V12.1. Right. Something. Right. But, but that's but the only knowing way. that and predicting that and being able to be right. prepared for that is. Currently, is sometimes we find out about it like too late. At least in the past, we did. I know maybe we've improved things recently, but that that's been an always been a tricky issue. This race condition for for, for certain customers, we are regularly getting requests. Once the update is published or released, we are getting requests for rebasing the PTFs they already have. But that's mostly because of uh, the attendance of, of uh, the individual customer uh, account manager. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have two questions. Um, the first one is how often are maintenance updates released for kernel? And if, you know, there is there some regular cadence for this? How often this happens? It, it mostly depends on which year you are interested in. In 2018, um, <laughs> it was dense uh, because of, of the hardware issues. Um, is, is there, is Marcus somewhere? He, he might have better answer. No, I don't see him. Mm -hmm. I would say that every two months are yeah, kind of. Regular support I think it's two months for LTS is six months, but that's theory. Yeah, <laughs> last year was um, disproving the theory. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it swings in both ways. So 
first there are critical issues, and on the other side, sometimes we don't fit the studio because there are so many mentions. So, well, that, that's the theory. That's the plan. Yeah. Okay, so months is what I should expect. When I see somebody saying, well, this will be released on the next maintenance of date for kernel, we're talking about months. That, that's, that's kind of a... Yeah. Uh, There is another point to that, uh, or there used to be another problem with this, because some critical issues got uh, so-called fast-track updates, uh, which only added uh, one specific fix for the critical security issue, which uh, is why I usually use the phrase in the next regular maintenance update. Because then, even if the fix was already in the kernel branch, if it was a fast track update, it, it only got one or two fixes on top of the previous update, not everything that was in Git. But the, uh, and there were even cases where we had three fast track updates in a row. Uh, but today we try to always use current Git state and uh, to avoid fast track updates. Yeah, I think that since last year we are mostly avoiding fast tracks. And as I'm seeing, Michal, I forgot to mention one of the responsibilities we have, uh, the, oh, which the unofficial one, is that we serve as an incubator for, uh, for labs. Um, that, that's one of the purposes of L3. Oh, sorry, I tried to be funny, but uh, <laughs> I didn't hit it. So I right, uh, my second question is, there is this, we're already moving to JIRA for feature implementation. And I'm, I'm wondering if there is a plan in your team as well to move to another tool that is not Bugzilla, or if you say, no, Bugzilla, we're so deeply attached to it, there's no way we can change. What, is the, what are the future plans for tooling? Do you think about moving to JIRA is basically what I'm asking. Uh, of course, if we have to consider it, uh, but there are no plans yet. As I've said, we are Bugzilla is not enough for us, so we use it as a communication tool, but the workflow is elsewhere, uh, the, and the tracking, so that no issues, no issue gets forgot, uh, forgotten. So we have our own tooling. And if we were to go to Jira, that would mean not only putting there Bugzilla, but also this workflow somehow re-implemented in Jira. I think it's possible and would have several advantages, but it's a uh, run, uh, long range run, that's clear. So uh, I kind of maintain App Armor, and uh, uh, I tend to procrastinate with respect to maintenance, which is like pretty sick. But uh, what I thought was that if L3 could, since they already have the RPM and the PDF, if they could just do a submit request, against the package, the original uh, maintenance package, it would just make it easier for the maintainer because all he has to do is a submit request. So it's kind of a suggestion, and if it does not work, why it does not work? Uh, the reason is uh, most of the patches which would come in would primarily come from L3s itself for a maintained package. So uh, uh, it may just make the workflow a little easier and probably faster turnaround time. Yeah. but. This is kind of Pandora box for us because. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Putting... I'm not trying to push things off my plate. I'm, I, I assume that's work, um, but but it's just that it'll it'll improve the turnaround time. That's all. Would be possible, but it's some. It would be some, something completely new to us, so that would have to be quite well defined. And I can imagine that for certain uh, certain maintainers, it would be really annoying. I don't know. Possible because from the maintenance point, uh, from the maintainer point of view, all you have once you do a submit request, all we have to do is either accept or reject the request for whether it is good or not. So if you accept, it's just gone going through and through. So it's not, it'll be just much less work. And because L3 has much more visibility when the responses come from the customer and what PDF number it is and things like that, they could just do an IO. Oh, sorry. Uh, OSC SR PDF number to the package. Okay, kind of but that gets me to a question: If uh, on what should the, the, this submit request be based? Uh, is the what we, as I've said, and that's important part, we base our work on the maintenance update to yes. get only the minimal fix. But I can, 
I, I would imagine that uh, that in build service, the project will be in some state of art form where there will be several more fixes. Actually, actually no. Once the package is released, the only bugs yeah. which we try to fix are L3 because we usually do not fix anything else coming in. Usually. Um, it's a normal, usual case. CVEs. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, I also had this discussion. The point is um, that you, have, uh, you may have other pending, uh, pending fixes in, in maintenance. And this is work for, 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 the, uh, for the maintainer then to get these all together. Um, this is currently um, rather often because maintenance updates take quite a long time or never happen uh, okay. while the PDF is out sure. and this is up to you. But some kind of process would be really nice. At, if it's the first, if it's the first uh, fix for a specific package, um, the maintainers have to do exactly the same and it's also a risk, yeah, because um, the PDF provided to the customer, um, you have to redo this manually to get a patch. Maybe there's a spec file change, you, you oversee whatever. Um, kind of thinking about this and getting a kind of process there would be really nice. So the first uh, uh, submission, if there is no pending maintenance update yet on this package, um, it would be, uh, it, it could be directly also submitted to the, to this, uh, to the um, product it, it, it got um, branched from, for example. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes sense, but then it may just increase L3 work in that oh. case, because they'll but have to start comparing with the packages. Yeah, but it all... No, but it also depends uh, there, on the packaging where it lives. There is one problem. Uh, we don't have uh, some development project for SLAS. We only have development projects for factory. So, uh, and the problem is that even if it is true that all bugs for a package are from L3, uh, which is not always the case, uh, then even then, n not all of the L3 fixes deserve a maintenance update of its own. So sometimes you have to accumulate few of them, and there is a problem that you cannot accept uh, a submit request against uh, SLE project uh, until it is supposed to be released as a maintenance update. And the package maintainer cannot merge in build service, merge yeah. different submit requests. So yeah, I understand, but he would eventually, he, if he says that there are too many sub submit requests coming in, he will, he will just reject it and do it himself or something of that sort. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah, for, for example, for my packages, I'm using Git to maintain the package and then export to build service. Yeah. So then I can do things outside, have some pending queue of yeah, uh, yeah. things to go to the next maintenance update and only submit them when yeah, I'm that's, going to do That's them. kind of your personal way of maintaining things, which is fine, I, I, I don't doubt that, but yeah. it's just that it'll, it might just make the workflow a little shorter. If, if this change uh, should be implemented, it has to be individual per package. That's I would say clear. Okay, any other uh, remarks? Thank you, no, no, not yet. Uh, okay, so now it's my part. Thank you. I would like to ask you for a feedback because I feel we are not getting it enough, so in order to improve ourselves, we need to have it. So what is your experience with L3 and where do you see we have room for improvement? If there are any suggestions, that this was one of them. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask the question, who has the ultimate responsibility of picking the patch that's going to be sent to the uh, customer? Sorry, who, who, who has the ultimate responsibility of picking the patch that will be used for a PTF? Is that the L3 engineer or is that people he asks information for? Uh, that's a good question and I didn't dive into the, this, but yeah. Um, we, we as L3 can decide any time to provide test package, which has no, uh, there is no guarantee of anything. There is no, no, no guarantee that it would not break customer systems. But uh, if, the pack, if the patch should be included in PTF, we must be pretty uh, sure that it's maintainable because PTFs are maintainable, and there, which means that we need the maintainer to approve it. There are certain cases where it's clear that the 
patch should be in, and we uh, we decide to provide it as a PTF right away. It's null pointer <coughs> or fix somewhere. Uh, but if it's more complicated case, we need to have uh, the maintainer approval for a patch for it to be uh, included in in the PTF. Okay. Uh, the, the the reason I'm asking is because recently I. I was asked for info, then I filed upstream a bug, then in that bug I posted the patch to coax a reaction out of an upstream maintainer, and the L3 uh, engineer took that patch, which was tested only on the test case that was reported, and sent it to the customer. And I was surprised. Um, okay, uh, this should not happen, and it, it's yeah. a breakage. And I will ask you for a name. So, so <laughs> no, my, I, my idea I, was, I know which one. <laughs> my, my idea was that maybe there should be some sign off of uh, but hereby I declare that this patch is ready for a PTF in some form in the Buxilla report, like patch uppercase colon, this is the patch, there you go, something like that. That's very good remark. Uh, we are, because various patches, uh, various packages use different workflows, we don't use this sign off, but we ask the maintainer for approval prior to providing it in a PDF. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, it's similar. It's about documentation um, of oh. this whole process. I think there is some kind of L3 documentation and some there kind is. of maintenance documentation. Um, but it would be really nice to have something for the maintenance point of view, um, and somehow some kind of you know, process with Shira or Confluence that you can somehow tech users as maintainers, as however, so that they can uh, can access this information easily. Recently, a package maintainer was added, and the three uh, guys said, please push it, and he didn't know at all what, have, uh, what he should do. Uh, he, he pushed it mainline. Um, there are quite a lot of maintainers coming in new, uh, they are changing, and it's a really important information which should, which should end up at the maintainer's yeah, I have to say I, I don't. I don't see the obstacle from maintenance point of view from L3. What's what's so um, what's so different? Um, from you, you have to know the background um, that the L3 guy is doing the PDF, and it's it's uh, it's your responsibility to to submit it to the right sleep products back. Yeah, that you have to uh, communicate with maintenance whether they are already pending patches that it could happen, that it takes a rather long time, that they're going to, to show up some maintenance update. And you know, this, this process, it's not that much, but it should end up at the maintainers, yeah. which are changing r frequently. And some, some new people, uh, some new guys, they don't have an idea what's going on in this important process. Uh, there's yet another safeguard of that the patch is uh, finding its way to maintenance, and that's that after the L3 issue is closed, uh, the maintenance is triggered which means that yet another team is having a look whether the, pa whether the fix is in the respective package, whether there shouldn't be a maintenance update triggered, etc. So there's yet another safeguard after the L3 is finished. Okay, because we are not allowed any more questions, thank you very much for <laughs> contributing. <laughs>